of radicals in the interstellar medium. Okay? So the trick that we use or the tools that we use are high resolution infrared spectroscopy uh, and the basic idea, you know, this is a fairly savvy audience in all these sorts of ways, but basically uh, we're using uh, what we call slit supersonic jet discharge expansions. That allows us to get long path lengths uh, and a high sensitivity for detection of radicals uh, that are then cooled uh, in a supersonic expansion down to on the order of 10 or 15 degrees Kelvin or so. Um, and what makes this work really is the ability to be able to look at absorption spectroscopy really at the, at the, essentially at the near quantum shot noise limit. That is to say, really limited by the statistics of how photons arrive on a detector. So let me just show you a little bit about our, our discharge. I think that uh, you know, it, 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 it's really just the f fact that it's a slit and a discharge that really ends up being so critically useful for us uh, uh, as spectroscopists in the infrared. It's a modulated discharge, so it generates a jet-cooled sequence, sort of a picket fence of radicals uh, that end up dropping down through the laser beam, and we detect the you know, uh, uh, you know, part and ten of the six sorts of modulation of the infrared light uh, as it passes through. The chemistry is actually really remarkably robust, and that is that we typically take, um, not always, but typically take uh, halogenated uh, alkanes or different sorts of species as precursors, electron, dissociative electron attachment to these species really quite cleanly makes the radical uh, and departs with a, uh, a halide anion. The densities <clears throat> under favorable circumstances uh, you know, can be even much higher than 10 to the 13 molecules per cc. Uh, at times we can get, you know, nearly a tour of radicals, uh, if you will. I mean, 10 to the 16 per cc uh, at the slit orifice, uh, n you know, only for the best radicals. But basically, those rapidly cool down into a very small number of quantum states, or relatively small number. Uh, and that basically gives us sort of this combined advantage of uh, high-resolution spectroscopy of pretty reactive molecules that have been cooled rapidly down to low enough temperatures so that this spectroscopy is understandable, okay? So that's sort of a picture of how it looks. You've got some sort of a, uh, this is actually a neon uh, diluent gas, but the, uh, it, come, it comes down uh, uh, and basically the, we have a multipass uh, in this direction uh, and we look at essentially part and 10 of the six sort of modulations in the absorptions going through. Good. Oh, and we, we can also do this with metal uh, ablated materials, and so there's some interest in being able to look at sort of more complicated organometallic systems as well. This is something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, mean, I call it the free lunch. Uh, there are very few free lunches in science, but this is actually really one of them. Uh, so if you have a slit uh, orifice um, and uh, you come in with infrared light, uh, if it's a pinhole, what you end up having is essentially expansion in two dimensions and the Doppler shift of the infrared light with respect to the molecules that are expanding is actually really still pretty much the size of uh, what you'd expect for the temperature of the stagnation region. But in a slit that's actually not true because molecules that try and move in this direction or this direction end up being collisionally collimated. Uh, so what you end up having is this pre-collimation by collisions in the slit. It suppresses the Doppler widths by about 10 to 20 fold. And the nice thing about that is that uh, you know, rather than throwing away those molecules, they all are there to absorb the laser light. So you get a comparable 10 to 20 fold enhancement of the absorption cross section for free. So you actually get resolution and sensitivity uh, from the same way. So this is just sort of a schematic, but basically rather than having sort of a blurred out absorption profile, you really end up having subdoppler profiles with the same integrated absorbance uh, for, that, for that purpose. So uh, I, I call this Beer's Law Revisited. Uh, we're all always working with absorbance and density and cross-section and path length. The slit gives us something like a hundred-fold enhancement in path length. 
the slit also gives us a slower density drop off uh, as a function of distance downstream. That's about another hundredfold enhancity in the density that you would get. And then on top of that, you have something like an order of magnitude and enhancement of the cross section, which you sort of think of as not being under your control, but it is by suppressing the Dopplowitz. The net effect is that we can see down to something on the order of 10 to the 7 molecules per cc per quantum state, which is already quite sensitive, but we really think that this should be upgradable with cavity uh, and infrared comb techniques, and Junyi and I are you know, scheming to be able to sort of couple these all together to be able to have broadband uh, ultra-sensitive -sens uh, methods that should improve this by something on the order of a thousand-fold or more, okay? So, uh, nevertheless, in our copious spare time, we've actually really looked at an awful lot of hydrocarbon systems uh, so far, and this is not even a complete list. But what I want to talk about a little bit today are two, you know, sort of canonical species, fennel, which I think is sort of the you know, the favorite, uh, you know, uh, in here, but also uh, some oxy uh, radicals, uh, in particular HOCO, uh, but I thought I'd sort of uh, spend a little bit of time at the very end telling you something about hydroxymethyl uh, and start out with just as a, as a, as a warm-up, uh, you know, just methyl radical as a simple test case, okay? So uh, let me just talk about methyl radical, and in particular, what happens when you do isotopic substitution uh, in, of, 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 of one of the hydrogens, right? So uh, what's the key idea? Methyl radical is, is, uh, is sort of millimeter microwave dark, uh, you know, for the obvious reasons. It just has no dipole moment. Uh, but it does have a weakly allowed dipole moment if you have some isotopic substitution. Uh, due to asymmetry in the zero point uh, you know, uh, stretching motion. So you know, d there's interest in CH2D uh, as a tracer molecule uh, for some hydrocarbon chemistry in the interstellar medium. What's helpful is also is therefore to have these sorts of uh, information to be able to guide millimeter microwave uh, sorts of detection. Uh, and I believe, actually, when this project first started out, the, the microwavers had not had, I think, think that this is actually now something where, uh, you know, uh, you know we, we, we now do have, uh, I, uh, I guess it's millimeter wave detection uh, of, of this sort of species. But let me tell you what this looks like in the infrared. Uh, so this is just uh, really, you know, a stick plot of experimental data and a stick plot of the simulation with residuals in terms of the fits that are basically on the order of you know, uh, something on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 3 uh, wave numbers. But if you look at each of the individual lines now, and I guess this is really either the symmetric or the asymmetric CH stretch, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of additional structure that's due to combination of spin rotation uh, and hyperfine. Now, I'm speaking to people, or at least some people, for whom this resolution looks, you know, pathetic, right? Uh, but it's remarkably good uh, for infrared. I mean, it's an order of magnitude or two better than what you can typically get uh, in, the, uh, in the infrared. Because of this sub-Doppler line shape and the ex uh, slit jet expansion geometry, so it provides access in the near infrared to fine and occasionally even hyperfine information uh, on open shell systems. Uh, so again, this is really no great shakes to the microwavers, but basically what you can do is look at spin rotation splitting, nuclear hyperfine, uh, even involving uh, the coupled pair of hydrogens and the deuterium. And in essence, what this really allows you to get uh, is, you know, absolutely good spin rotation information and even partial hyperfine uh, information uh, for the Fermi contact interactions. And let me just tell you just, I mean, this is just sort of as a warm-up example, but uh, this is sort of uh, it, interesting. So uh, if I look, there actually really was some previous work from Fourier transform studies by Kawaguchi et al. that had uh, attempted under a uh, essentially sort of a, 
uh, discharge cell conditions to be able to get spin rotation information. It, you know, here's, here's what you get uh, uh, spectroscopically with subdoppler resolution. It's really quite off from what people had gotten from Fourier transform instruments. But in fact, it really turns out to be pretty much bang on if you just you know, take the simple physical picture that you're rotating charged species and they're generating magnetic fields and those magnetic fields are interacting with the, you know, with the electron spin, if you will. I, I know that pure spectroscopists hate it when I use that physical picture, but I think it's remarkably good, really. Okay? Uh, so you know, basically scaling by changes in rotational constants, so in other words, the rate with which these molecules are tumbling. Very consistent with a simple physical picture of spin rotation uh, coming from essentially magnetic fields uh, uh, for the electron spin. Uh, and you, know, you can even see that there's small but uh, quite substantial changes uh, you know, due to the vibrational state. So again, challenges for ab initio theory, if you will. OK, well, let, let's, let, let's jump the complexity to something which uh, you know, uh, is more interest in the interstellar medium, for sure. Um, and we were inspired by the work that's been done here at the uh, Harvard Smithsonian Observatory. Uh, we've got Carl here and Mike. Uh, question is, how far can you take infrared methods? And that's actually not a stupid thing to think about. Uh, because when you get to systems with this many uh, degrees of freedom, the role of vibrational relaxation uh, inside the molecule is bound at some point to raise its beautiful or ugly head. I don't know how, how you care to think about it. In other words, you're exciting a CH stretch. You've got lots of state density in the molecule. Uh, how well will you have a high resolution infrared spectrum? So we sort of walked in this direction with a certain amount of trepidation, not knowing if we'd see anything at all. But in fact, it really turns out that the spectroscopy under these jet-cooled conditions, subdoppler, it's still remarkably good. In fact, as far as we can tell, completely unaffected by the presence of IVR. So the answer is, will it defeat high resolution? Not really yet. And I'll show you how far I th we think we can go. But uh, let me just describe, this is now the CH stretch manifold. There obviously are five hydrogens in phenyl radical. Uh, and the three strongest vibrations infrared-wise are nu-19 and nu-1 and nu-2. These others are actually really quite weak, but we've been able to see the three strongest CH stretch vibrations. So uh, just to confuse you, the A1 symmetry vibrations are going to be B-type, and the B2 symmetry vibrations are going to be A-type. Okay? So you know, <clears throat> Don Levy taught me you know, uh, they, when you talk about spectroscopy to people that are not terribly interested in high resolution spectroscopy, although I think this crowd probably is, you need to sort of give them guide, you know, signposts. So here's a primer on recognizing band types. So A band types uh, for an oblate molecule are going to look like, um, you know, P and R branches with strong Q branches coming out, and B type bands are going to look like PNR branches with really relatively suppressed uh, Q branch uh, types, if you will. Okay? So that's the big picture. So here's one of the bands uh, in phenyl. And your challenge is to recognize you know, what type of band type it is. Okay? Uh, you see the strong Q branch. Uh, if I blow that up, here's all the structure that comes from uh, that Q branch. Again, this is infrared. Uh, but not bad at all. You know, line widths on the order of 10 to the minus, uh, you know, a couple times 10 to the minus three wave numbers, very good signal to noise. This is a simulation based purely on, you know, rigid rotor or, you know, centrifugally distorted rigid rotor. No intramolecular vibrational relaxation processes are present, okay? So it bodes really quite well for even larger aromatic species, okay? So, you know, this is a teaching moment, if you will. Uh, one of the nice things about the infrared is that it allows you, that, that's the actual experimental data, it allows you to really get reliable intensities. And so one of the things that this allows you to do is, uh, is to 
uh, look at nuclear spin statistics and if you uh, can compare these are two predictions based on either uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know Ka plus Kc being even and Ka plus Kc either a 10 to 6 or a 6 to 10 nuclear spin and you know perhaps no surprise the nuclear spin statistics really confirm the electronic symmetry of the ground state that's a nice thing to have um, and it also really sort of confirms that the uh, the radical uh, density is basically due to a sigma orbital uh, in the fennel in the fennel so it's a predominantly sigma molecular orbital okay confirmation by nuclear spin statistics uh, if if you look carefully at this spectrum though what you find is that there's actually more structure I apologize for the you know something happened here that's not really seeing everything but I'll just blow this up but what what's actually really occurring here is you have a, a a B type transition that really arises now from uh, the new one uh, uh, CH stretch and just to show you again you blow it up at high resolution here's experiment here's simulation you're really doing quite well again without any inclusion of IVR sorts of effects and here's the weakest band type uh, and I think you can see absence of a Q branch nice PNR branch uh, but even there, if you uh, look at a, a little blow up, you know, the signal noise is still not so bad. Uh, and you can see that one basically is starting to crack uh, the infrared spectroscopy of something like phenyl radical. Okay? So here's the great work uh, done. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, don't, yeah, I guess it's still down in, you know, it, I mean, it's not here. It's, it's, it's a few blocks away. But in any event, uh, really the pioneering work uh, on phenyl radical done here. So here's just a sample rotational constants and vibrational frequencies for new one and new two symmetric stretches uh, in this way. Okay? So, you know, I, so clearly we don't do as well as the microwavers, uh, but information that we do get are the substantial significant shifts as a function of vibrational excitation in these radicals, as well as just where the vibration actually is uh, uh, to be seen. So, um, you know, I, I think I, 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 you know, this is like Coles to Newcastle, but as you analyze this type of, uh, you know, structure, uh, you know, which you guys have done fantastically better, what you end up having, I like simple freshman chemistry pictures because I often teach freshman chemistry, but basically this is sort of a picture of what one might anticipate to be happening for the deformation of the phenyl radical uh, and, you know, my simple picture is basically this flattening of this carbon, carbon, carbon bond angle that I think of as really a fight between sp2 type hybridization in benzene versus a more sp type hybridization of the carbon radical center in phenyl radical. But I'm speaking to people or some people that just do this so much better uh, then I'll, I'll just shut up uh, in that way. But what we can talk about nicely is really what the vibrational frequencies look like uh, in the gas phase uh, versus that uh, of, the, uh, of the matrix. And what I have plotted here are the intensities experimentally uh, in blue in the matrix results of Barney Ellison uh, from some time ago and then uh, you know, modest ca calculated intensities uh, from ab initio. And you can see that, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's reasonably, uh, you know, good agreement, certainly between theory and experiment in this way, okay? The actual vibrational frequencies themselves are, are respectably different between uh, gas phase and matrix studies. Uh, for new 19, the agreement is really almost, you know, unexpectedly good. But for new 2 and new 1, there's really a very strong, uh, you know, I guess it would be a blue shift in the matrix results. And so we were going like, hmm, that's interesting. New 19 was bang, was within like a tenth of a wave number of matrix. But new 1 and new 2 are really strongly blue shifted. So here's a you know, simple picture for this, uh, and that is, you know, when you excite 
symmetric sorts of breathing mode things, you're actually really being crowded by uh, the matrix, or at least that's one picture of it. And that crowding by the matrix is something will tend to blue shift uh, really what the vibrations uh, end up being. Uh, whereas if you excite uh, new 19, which basically sort of has this side to side motion that allows you know, the, the fennel to sort of you know, not be crowded as much because it's sort of pulling, it's, you know, the Lord taketh and the Lord giveth away or whatever. Uh, but the basic idea is that there's less crowding. That we think would be a simple physical picture for why the blue shift is essentially nothing at all uh, in this, okay? All right, so this, this may be the most important slide uh, in, this, in this presentation. Uh, Okay, so fennel radical, clearly you can see it with high resolution infrared. Uh, you know, what else can we do? Um, well, uh, uh, you know, we did calculations uh, you know, calculating really what the density of vibrational states would be as a function of the uh, 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 internal vibrational energy of the molecule. Now this is you know, based on work that, uh, that we did a long time ago and Bob Field and I collaborated on for a good many years as well, uh, you know, we, we really could uh, you know, uh, identify through high resolution methods that there's basically a critical density of vibrational states at about 100 per wave number where basically the density is large enough to have uh, energy, uh, you know, strong coupling of CH stretches into the uh, uh, dense uh, vibrational state manifold. So I have, this is log base 10, so 2 there is basically the, the line that corresponds to about 100 per wave number. And then here's really what the plots look like for all single aromatic rings. So I've got a bunch, you know, t you know benzyl and then a bunch of uh, nitrogen radical rings. Uh, and you can see that in the CH stretch region, the density of vibrational states is really still only about one per wave number, okay? And even with something as big as, let's say, uh, naphthalene or, or, or the radical of that, it's still uh, just a skosh under 100 per wave number, right? By the time you get up to three rings, uh, I think the story is over, at least in the CH stretch region. But I think this actually really bodes quite well for being able to look at a large number of single ring and with luck, maybe even a double ring uh, 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 aromatic uh, ring radical species. Okay? So that's basically, I think, really where the future of this ends up uh, you know, going. Carl, do I have uh, five or ten minutes? Yes. Okay. So let, 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 me, let me talk about some oxy radicals. Uh, so this is uh, one of my favorite... Uh, combustion uh, intermediates. I have Bill here, Bill Green. Uh, so this is HOCO, uh, and HOCO, uh, for those of you that don't know, is really you know incredibly relevant in the oxidation of CO in combustion. Um, not that there's a lot of combustion in the interstellar medium, but there's for sure you know going to be a fair amount of HOCO. Uh, one one would imagine, and there's a long and beautiful story. Uh, that Ian Smith first started here, looking at the temperature dependence of these sorts of rate constants for OH oxidation of CO. And this is all postulated to have, you know, this collision complex originally that was thought to be metastable with respect to H plus CO2. And indeed it is. But in fact, it turns out to be very, uh, uh, you know, stable. And it's really quite a stable radical intermediate and uh, it's been looked at a uh, number of ways. You guys have seen it too, right? right? Uh, but the first microwave study, I think, was done by Endo. Okay? Uh, and a lot of matrix isolation. Brad Moore did a nice infrared study of the OH stretch mode. Uh, what I'm showing here now is a sub-Doppler jet-cooled spectrum uh, of trans-HOCO. Uh, and I guess I just really sort of you know, I'm just going to show you a very little bit of information. Here's just rotational progressions uh, in, uh, in an R branch to, to try and sort of uh, elucidate the fact that we not only get a symmetry structure, but we also get 
spin rotation uh, information out on this radical, okay? And uh, so this gives us really first infrared access into spin rotation dynamics uh, in, in a radical like this. So that's maybe a little bit more explicit uh, uh, example of the spin rotation information. Um, uh, and again, really facilitated by the subdoppler uh, resolution, if you will, okay? So challenges for ab initio, dynamical theories uh, to, to look at. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a small uh, point of interest, and that is we're exciting the OH stretch here. Here are the inertial axes in HOCO, as they call it, and you really would expect that there would be B-type as well as A-type bands uh, in something like that, okay? Uh, you know, when Brad Moore did this, in fact, they looked explicitly for these B-type bands, and, you know, uh, it was just too hard, I guess, under uh, room temperature uh, sorts of conditions. But uh, at least under our conditions, it's, they just stand out like, you know, uh, you know they stand out in incredibly. Here, here are A-type transitions, and here are B-type transitions, and they're just there completely long for the ride. Now, what's nice there is that allows us to be able to then measure really what the angle of the transition moment is with respect to the inertial axes. And uh, so let me just see if I can, uh, oh, I guess to do that you need to basically just, you know, understand something about Boltzmann analysis. Uh, but basically this allows you to get the ratio of the A-type and B-type uh, vibrational transition moments. Uh, and you can see that it's only down by a factor of two for the B-type, if you will. Uh, and if you compare with theory, uh, well, I don't know, you know, density functional probably isn't going to impress anybody in this room, but I'm happy to have someone do better. Uh, but basically, 1.85, uh, 1.78, uh, basically good agreement uh, for these fundamental sorts of simple radicals. Okay? So that's sort of, yeah, please. Uh, there's no lambda doubling because it's a bent radical, so I think all orbital angular momentum is actually quenched. So what we're seeing is spin rotation structure, and then then we also see asymmetry case splitting. So, so that is splitting in the Q branch due to spin orbit. Uh, splitting in the Q branch there, that is really a spin rotation structure. It, it actually that that may be K, uh, asymmetry splitting. I think that is. Let me let me let me just go back. Pretty sure that's asymmetry splitting. Huh? Yeah, that that's asymmetry splitting. Okay, but uh, because basically the spin rotation structure sort of you know dies out uh, uh, as you get up to higher J in this way. But I, I, you know, if if Mike, you know, I'm, I'm, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure it's spin rotation. Um, okay, so let's see. I think that's pretty much. I think I have a sneak preview for the microwavers here, uh, and that is this hydroxymethyl radical, which, by the way, spectroscopy, when you cr crush infrared spectrum down to sort of a conventional scale, it looks like crap, but in fact, it's not. Uh, so let me just show you a blow up of this. Uh, so let's see, uh, you know, that's what it looks like at high resolution. It still is really quite good. Uh, so uh, CH2OH, hydroxymethyl, as we all know, met methanol is sort of, I don't know, the spectral weed, don't, don't we call it that, right? So hydroxymethanol, uh, methyl's got to be there. Uh, and, but one of the interesting questions really has been sort of the barrier for this hydroxytorsional tunneling. And uh, you know, all, you know, let me just say this is sort of hot off the presses, but basically we're resolving now the tunneling splittings uh, in hydroxymethyl, and the you know, more to be stated, but basically by analyzing the tunneling splittings, it would look like these tunneling splittings are in the microwave region uh, that you guys should be able to see pretty quickly. I, I, I'm, 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 it's it's a high barrier. Uh, so the tunneling splittings are on the order of about a tenth, tenth of a wave number or so. It 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 it's not that complex. 
The splittings still are on the order, I think the sum of the tunneling splittings are on the order of a few tenths of a wave number, and we think they're evenly uh, split in the ground in the excited state, but, but we'll have to get more. Yeah, Bill. Do you see if there's any umbrella motion on the... Ah, yeah, okay, all right, so, all right, so, so the cognoscenti know that this really is not just a pure torsion, it's actually a combination you know, a, a, of a torsion and, and, and a wagging, okay? So, in fact, you need to include both of those. It's a multidimensional quantum problem. And let me just invite anyone who's interested in multidimensional quantum mechanics to help us crack that, because there's actually significant wobbling of the methyl group, because even though it's nominally a pi radical, as you tilt the OH up and down, I, I don't know if you want to call it steric effects or electronic effects, but it basically bends this away from a planar structure. Okay, so that, that applies to the ground state, or just the excited? It applies to both the ground and the excited state. Now, the interesting question is whether or not the excited state does it more or less. And again, we're just sort of in the middle of of, of, of this analysis. But the but the but this breaking away, if you actually look at, we've calculated a full potential energy surface in two dimensions for this. We haven't yet been able to do converged quantum calculations in two dimensions. Uh, you know, we're, we're still working on that. But the flopping away from planarity is something like, you know, 10 degrees. So it's really quite substantial. Okay? But anyway, so I, I, I think this really ought to allow us to be able to make the microwavers have an easy time to search for this. And then, perhaps the radio astronomers to be able to search for it as well. Okay, so by way of summary, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that the infrared is not such a bad place to work, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that you can get hot react radicals at cold temperatures, benchmark comparisons, uh, opportunities to profit from, you know, multiple spectroscopies as well as to help uh, other spectroscopies uh, uh, for a detection uh, of uh, transients uh, in the astronomical community. So with that, let me just uh, thank some of the folks that were involved with this. So shoot, we've got you know Grant Buckingham, uh, uh, Chuan Chang, uh, Melanie Roberts, this is a little bit of an older one, uh, Feng Wang, uh, Aaron Sharp, who's actually not even here, and some of the funding agencies and some theoretical help. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, okay. So, uh, right. We, we have looked, I mean, we've got outstanding signal to noise for trans hoko. And we have searched, you know, well, that's part of where Joel Bowman comes in here, for the, for the, for the cis, or for the, for the cis hoko. And, you know, we see plenty of lines, but nothing that looks at least like a rigid, uh, you know, replica, uh, you know, of, of what the Sissoko spectrum should look like. So now, you know, the interesting question, is that just incompetent spectroscopist, uh, or is that really dynamic? Okay? No, I mean, you know, you know, believe me, you know, we think about that. Uh, but, it, but you're making it how? By yeah, okay. H right, so, H. so uh, you know, so originally, I mean, this is, this is really an important question. Originally, I told the students, I said, make it from H plus CO2, okay? And then they tried that for a while, and then they said, David, we didn't find it, but we did find it immediately when they have OH plus CO. Uh, and so you know, they like signal, and so they went off and started looking at things with signal. Uh, they've not gone back to H plus CO2 as a way of making it, but with OH plus CO, we don't really seem to find it. Now, you know, it's... It, it, there can be multiple sources for reasons why, it, you know, uh, above and beyond that we're bad spectroscopists, right? Or at least not, you know, our resolution is not as good, perhaps. Uh, you know, one is that you really stabilize in the trans well when you come in from H plus or OH plus CO, and I'd love to have Bill's thought on that. In a slit expansion, the collisional frequencies are really much higher than in a pinhole. So when you bring something together, the probability of relaxing down into the first well 
is a lot higher than it would be in a conventional pinhole expansion, right? So that's one dynamical reason. It locks down there and doesn't get a chance to go over, which would really say, come at it from the other direction uh, with H plus CO2. The other possibility that I, I don't want to rule out is that you excite the OH stretch here. You're above the H plus CO2 uh, exit channel, and you can have tunneling assisted chemistry, and this could, in principle, fall apart in the excited state fast enough so that we you know, have some broadening that may be lowering our sensitivity. We, we honestly don't know what the story is here, but I'd love to have any input that you got here. Uh, we, we could do deuterium, yes. And deuterium would certainly uh, you know, drop that down. So that, 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 that's a good suggestion. As it turns out, you know, whereas in the microwave, going from HOCO to DOCO is just, you know, you guys just sort of tweak your oscillators a little bit. For us, going from HOCO to DOCO oh, okay. is, uh, you know, is, is actually, you know, uh, quite a journey, but, but perhaps a journey worth, in fact, taking. Just a, another question, and that is in the last spectrum you showed on the, on the new molecule, right. there are a lot of what appear to be downgoing peaks. Oh, right, were yeah. Were those uh, <laughs> instrumental, or is that no, no. some significance to that? No, those are all real. Was, I mean, yeah, so, uh, so this, yeah. all this sort of stuff yes. here. So, you know, so here's the... Dirty laundry among, you know, it's not, not really dirty laundry, but, you know, uh, you know, the slits have a great deal of gas which comes out uh, in, in, into the chamber, so that even with roots blowers pumping on this, we may have 10 millitor uh, of species. So you end up having precursor <coughs> gas in, uh, uh, in the expansion chamber, so when the supersonic expansion turns on, you actually are pushing low densities of precursor molecules away from the laser. And so these downward going peaks basically are generally precursor peaks. You can always tell them because they are Doppler broadened. So we have a, a Doppler broadened pedestal that might be 300 megahertz broad, but all these upward going peaks are sub-Doppler and on the order of about, you know, 60 megahertz or so wide in that way. Uh, How did you make that? Excuse me? How did you make that? Ah, good. Uh, we, we do it a couple different ways. Uh, you know, the first way we did it was just, you know, you just put a drop or two of methanol uh, in a, you know, neon and then expand through the discharge. But it really turns, turns out that um, you can do better uh, by uh, having a mixture of chlorine and methanol. And so what you do is you, the discharge very efficiently generates chlorine radicals. Chlorine radicals cannot uh, energetically remove the hydroxyl uh, 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 H, but quite cleanly can remove the, uh, the methyl, uh, you know, CH. You so don't that get really, addition or anything. Excuse me? You don't get chlorine addition. Uh, we probably do. You know, uh, a yeah, little. No, it's not. It's not. It's not, a, it's not a but but you know, at high it. resolution, you know, uh, we we're, we're, you know one can one can learn to ignore it. Uh, but you know, basically, you, 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 the the um, uh, you know, the discharge occurs you know one to two microseconds before the game is over. So there's really not that much time for more than single chemical reaction. Now, maybe some sort of radical well, addition would that, be possible. The but evidence of our radical or ion chemistry outside beyond the orifice as a new expansion? Yeah, so, uh, so Carl, you know, uh, the, the answer is, if you had asked me that question two years ago, I'd say, no chance. You know, uh, you got one, one to two microseconds, and then maybe you have 10 microseconds in an expansion. But now, I would say, we do see chemistry, uh, but it's got to be very fast chemistry. So for example, when we do acetylene discharges and we generate C2H, we generate diacetylene, triacetylene, yeah, well, tetracetylene. Yeah, Howard showed that several years ago in John Myers. Now you, know, you, you That's several orifices. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so, I think, you know, diameters, but uh, 
you know what the units were now. The semis, yeah. some, from the orifice, but you still see you, uh, you, the chemistry, of result you, of the chemistry. You still can see that. The primary that chemistry is really, you know, it, you know, primarily there's not much chemistry. It's mostly just what is occurring in the in the one or two microseconds uh, in that. Would you say the same, what you just said, would that apply to ions? Like, uh, yeah, this is, or anions no, no, well? no, no, that's a very good question. Uh, and I guess I would say, uh, you know, when it comes to, to, to ions, uh, of course the re reaction rates, you know, become temperature independent, more or less, uh, and are much faster, sort of more near Langevin. So we do see ion chemistry uh, continue on out. And in particular, we see things like electron ion recombination chemistry. So. You know, we, we did studies, you know, on H3 plus a long time ago where you looked at electron H3 plus uh, recombination chemistry and you could really see that as a function of distance downstream. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, this radical. Uh, we have detected the isomer methosine, CH3O. Uh -huh. Okay. And it's really a very good uh, potential right. candidate. Right. Uh, how good could be the prediction for, for the ground state, for the rotational line? So you're talking about methoxy? Yeah, no, yeah. no, for this one. From the data you have for the, from the infrared data, right. I assume that you can predict that the ground base, uh, the ground state rotational line. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with uh, which accuracy? Um, you know, we're just in the middle of sort of untangling the spin rotation contributions, but, you know, let me just say, when we do, uh, the predictions would be would make it an easy day for you know my, my session chairman. I don't know, you know, uh, you know, to to within ten megahertz or something like that. Is that is that good enough? 